Our water growing short, we anchored off a little settlement. Here our captain put on a British uniform and waited on the commandant of the place, who gave evident suspicions that he was not an English officer. To prevent the awkward consequences of a detection, our captain promised to send off a barrel of hams and a keg of butter. Then our crafty commander returned to his vessel and left the place very early next morning. It was now the middle of March, and we had taken nothing, nor had we fired our cannon, except at a miserable sort of a half-boat and half-raft, called a catamaran, made of five light logs with a triangular sail. From the men on this miserable vessel, we got information of a good watering place, where we soon anchored. The commandant of this little settlement was the color of our North American Indians, and so were his family but the rest were nearly as black as negroes. He offered us snuff out of a box tipped with silver, but everything else looked very rude and simple. While we were getting our water, the females hovered around us. They seemed to admire our complexions. One of these women opened the bosom of one of our fairest young men to see if his body was as white as his face. She appeared to be highly amused with the discovery, and called her companions to come and view the phenomenon. The Commandant told our captain that he had just received a message from the Commandant of Gamora to seize him and all his crew and send us to Pernambuco. So we set sail for the United States, and had not been at sea long before we were chased by a frigate, but outsailed her. On the 20th of May, we made Gayhead. The next morning, we discovered a ship and a brig waiting for us. We now, for the first time, hoisted American colors, when the brig gave us a broadside and kept up a constant fire upon us. But we soon left her by our superior sailing and management. The frigate was not so easily got rid of. She came almost within musket shot of us, when she fired repeated broadsides into our little schooner. Our brave little captain went down below, telling the men to fight it out, but they prudently struck their colors. A boat soon came on board with a lieutenant and twelve marines. Our men, according to custom when a vessel surrenders, seized whatever casks of liquor they could come at, filled out a few horns of gin, and passed it round among the marines. Shut up in the dark, with ninety-nine distressed young men like so many galley slaves or guinea negroes, excluded from the benefit of the common air, without one ray of light or comfort. I never was so near sinking into despair. This is the diary of Benjamin Waterhouse, who, strangely enough, was the first person to test the smallpox vaccine in America. And to make that even stranger, he initially tested it on his own children. But when he was well into his 50s, the War of 1812 broke out, and he joined the American Navy as a doctor. But as you can see, he was taken prisoner. The ship he was on sailed to Brazil, that's where Pernambuco is that he mentioned, and obviously the power of the British Navy is demonstrated by the fact that the American officer wears a British uniform. However, on their route back to America, he was captured by the British. Now, he is partial to being a little bit dramatic at times, which can even be seen in the title of his book, which is wonderfully 19th century. The three nations he is referring to are France, Britain, and America. And, although he says he only gives political characters of three nations, he in fact provides some pretty good observations about other nationalities. These he met while after being in British custody in Canada, he was put onto a prison ship, along with other prisoners from the Napoleonic Wars. This breakfast was a pint of liquid, which they call burgoo, which is a kind of oatmeal gruel, about the consistence of the swill which our farmers give their hogs, and not a bit better in quality. It is made of oatmeal, which we Americans very generally detest. Our people consider ground oats as only fit for cattle, and it is never eaten by the human species. It is said that this oatmeal porridge was introduced to the British prisons by the Scotch influence, and we think that none but hogs and Scotchmen ought to eat it. 
The highly favored Scotch have the exclusive privilege of supplying the miserable creatures whom the fortune of war has thrown into the hands of the English with this national dish, so delicious to Scotchmen and so abhorrent to an American. On the 3rd of September, 1813, we sailed from Halifax with a Belpomene. On board of this ship were a number of Irishmen who had enlisted in our regiments and were captured in Upper Canada, fighting under the colors of the United States of America. The condition of these Irishmen was truly pitiable. We fled from our native land, said these unfortunate men, to avoid the tyranny and oppression of our British taskmasters, and the same tyrannical hand has seized us here, and sent us back to be tried, and perhaps executed as rebels. The quality of the bread served out to us on board was not fit and proper for any human being. It was old, and more like the powder of rotten wood, and to crown all, it was full of worms. Often have I seen our poor fellows viewing their daily allowance of bread with mixed sensation of pain and pleasure, with smiles and tears, not being able to determine whether they had best eat it all up at once or to eat it in small portions through the day. Some would devour all their bread at once, worms and all, while others would be eating small portions through the day. Some picked out the worms and threw them away. Others eat them. The Scotch are brave soldiers, but we Americans have found them to be the most hard-hearted and cruel people we have ever met with. Cruel as a Scotchman has become a proverb in the United States. The Scotch officers have been remarked for treating our officers, when in their power, with insolence and expressions of contempt more so than the English. It is also said that a Scotch officer that superintends the horrid whippings is more hard-hearted than an English one. It is certain that they are generally preferred as Negro drivers in the West India Islands. We reached the River Medway, which rises in Sussex and passes by Tunbridge, Maidstone, and Rochester. In this river, lay a number of Russian men of war, detained here, probably by way of pledge or the fidelity of the emperor. We passed up to where the prison ships lay after dark, and the prospect appeared very pleasant, as the prison ships appeared to us illuminated. We were ordered on board the Crown Prince prison ship, and marched along the deck between two rows of emaciated Frenchmen, who had drawn themselves up to review us. We then passed on to the part of the ship which was occupied by the Americans, who, sticking to their national characteristic, put more question to us in ten minutes than we could well answer in as many hours. The Frenchmen in this prison ship, instead of occupying themselves with forming a constitution and making a code of laws, had erected billiard tables and wheels of fortune, not merely for their own amusement, but to allure the Americans to hazard their money. They seemed calculated gamesters. Their vivacity, their readiness, and their everlasting professions of friendship were nicely adapted to inspire confidence in the unsuspecting American ledger domain about them. When they knew that we had received money for the work we had been allowed to perform, they were very attentive and flattering. They would come and say, Oh, Boston, fine town, very pretty. General Washington, tres grand homme, and allure our men once more to their wheels of fortune. There were some Danes as well as Dutchmen. Here we see the thick skulled plodding Dane making a wooden dish, or else some of the most ingenious making a very clumsy ship. And there we see a Dutchman picking to pieces tarred ropes, which, when reduced to its original form of hemp, they call oakum or else you see him lazily stowed away in some corner with his pipe, surrounded with smoke, and steeping his senses in forgetfulness. While the Frenchman keeps sober, the American and English sailor will indulge in their favorite grog. In this respect, I see no difference between English and American. 
Over the can of grog, the English forgets all his hardships and slavery. Yes, slavery. For where is there a greater slavery among white men than that of impressed Englishmen on board of one of their own men of war? The Englishman, when his skin is full of grog, glows with idolatry for his country and his favorite lass, as does the American. Our men parodied all their national songs. Rule Britannia was Rule Columbia, and God Save Great George was sung by our boys, God Save Great Madison. Our situation was the most unpleasant during the night. It was the practice every night to count the prisoners as they went down below, and then the hatchways are barred down and the ladder drawn up. Every precaution that fear inspires adopted to prevent our escape, or our rising up our prison keepers. They cared but little for the Frenchmen, but were in constant dread of the persevering efforts of the Americans. They had built around the sides of the ship, and little above the surface of the water, a stage on which the sentries walked during the whole night, singing out every half hour, all's well. Beside these sentries, they had a floating guard in boats, rowing around all the ships during the live-long night. There were attempts then to rise and take these man-of-war transports, but that they were always betrayed by some Englishman or Irishman that had crept into American citizenship. I hope the time is not far off, when we shall reject from our service every man not known absolutely to have been born in the United States. Whenever these foreigners get drunk, they betray their partiality to their own country and dislike of ours. I hope our Navy will never be disgraced or endangered by these renegades. Our prison ship contained a pretty well-organized community. We were allowed to establish an internal police force for our own comfort. We elected a president and twelve counselors, who we called committee men, but instead of four years, they held office but for four weeks. We made laws and regulations respecting personal behavior and cleanliness, for we had some lazy, lifeless, dirty fellows among us. They required tending like children. They were like hogs whose delight it is to eat, sleep, and wallow in the dirt. But I urged, as a medical man, that the punishment of a confined black hole was a very unequal punishment, for some men of weak lungs and debilitated habit might die under the effects. I maintained that it was wicked, a sin against human nature, to take a well man, put him in a place that should destroy his health, and very possibly shorten his days. So here are the wonderful old stereotypes of other inmates on board the prison ships, including the Dutch breaking up old ropes to get the hemp to smoke it. He would remain on board this prison ship for a long time, but I should say that the real term for these vessels were prison hulks. These had been used during the American Revolution, and it is said more people died in the prison hulks than during battles. But at the same time, I should say that a lot of the reports of the ship seem to be a tad over-exaggerated. Many Frenchmen during the Napoleonic Wars, for instance, claimed that they were used to exterminate people, but this wasn't exactly true. That's not to say the prisoners were kept in good conditions, after all, around 5-10% to of people would die on board, but it's far from an extermination ship. Otherwise, the prison hulks continued to play a role across the British Empire, and some famous ships like the HMS Discovery would be converted into prison hulks later on. Waterhouse would later be transferred to different prisons, but for this video at least, I'm just going to cover his time on the prison ship. Had not the French proved themselves to be a very brave people, I should have doubted it. On board the prison ship, they would scold, quarrel, and fight by slapping each other's chops with a flat hand and cry like so many girls. Perhaps such a man as Napoleon Bonaparte could make any nation courageous. I have been amused amid captivity on observing the volatile Frenchman singing, fencing, grinning and gambling, while the American lifts his hearty front, despising the all. But it is now the 30th of November, 
and we have had a troubled sky and fog for several weeks past. It has even sobered our Frenchmen, as they do not sing and caper. During the war, it was stated to our government that 6,257 seamen had been pressed and forcibly detained on board British ships of war. And this slavery has been the subject of merriment and a theme for ridicule among the Federalists. They say it makes no more difference to a sailor what ship he is on board. England is mistress of the ocean, and it is not worthwhile losing profitable trade for the sake of a few ignorant sailors. At the outbreak of war, some noble British commanders admired the American patriotic spirit and permitted them to quit their ships and go to prison, while other captains ordered them to return to what they called their duty. Then, if the Americans still refused to fight, put in irons and fed on scant allowances of bread and water, for if anything can bring down the high spirit of a hardy young man, it is a slow torture of hunger and thirst. When it is found that this had not had the effect of debasing the American spirit, the young sufferer was brought upon deck and... Oh, my pen cannot write it for indignation. Yes, my countrymen, our noble-minded young men are violently stripped and tied fast by a rope to a cannon or to the gangway, and he is whipped by a long, heavy, and hard-knotted whip, four times more formidable than the whip used by the carters on horses. The boatswain's mate, who is selected for his strength, lashes this young man on his delicate skin until his back is cut from his shoulders to his waist. Some of these poor wretches have been known to gnaw the flesh of their own arms in the agonies of torture. When the Algerians captured some of our vessels and made slaves of the crew, it was the subject of every newspaper and oration. But we have many sailors who have been enslaved at Algiers and have been impressed on board British men of war and afterwards thrown into their prison ships. The united opinion of these people is that the Algerian slavery is much more tolerable than the British slavery. The Algerians make the common sailors work from six to eight hours in the day, but they give them good food and lodge them in airy places and always employ officers according to their ranks.